And what a great time we've had so far today. Thank you guys for being in here. Thank you, lobby crew, for being out in the lobby with us. And as Cody said, it is day eight of 21 days of prayer. And so today we're starting something new, which is a global prayer moment. We're going to do this once a month. And one of the reasons that we're having a global prayer moment is we want to remind ourselves of God's passion and his heart for the nations. He loves the nations. So when we take time to pray for the nations, it, it more aligns our heart with Jesus's. And we want to try to equip you to pray for our global partners. We have great global partners all over the world. And today we're praying for one of our partners in North Africa. I cannot say her name for security reasons, but there are going to be some pictures on the screen just giving you a glimpse of where she is taking the good news, the gospel of Jesus to people, a lot of whom have never heard it. And so she is doing a great work there. And here's how we can come alongside her in prayer. The first thing that we can do is we can pray for transitions. Um, th their team has a lot of visa issues, which means that they're in flux a lot, and that can be very frustrating. So just pray for favor and ease of transitions amidst visa issues. The second thing that we want to pray for is just hope. They live amongst the people who are very discouraged, downtrodden, and, and it can be easy for her and the team to feel that way also. But she reminded us that Jesus offers us living hope, and that hope is contagious. So pray that her and the team would be filled with living hope and it would be contagious, and then also for opportunities. Our partner is going to be doing more work than ever at the second location of their school, so she's stepping into those opportunities. We're just going to pray that Jesus would use her. I'm going to put these back on the screen in just a moment as we pray. And if you want to take a picture of that, you can definitely pick it, take a picture to pray. Or if you just want more information, Jade's email is going to be on the screen. Jade is incredible. She leads our local and global serving as well as community groups. So if you like want this partner's name, if you want to be on her email list, if you want more information about how we can support her, then you can just email Jade and she will get that to you. So we're going to put those uh, prayers back on the screen from the lobby to the front. Let's stand up. We're going to have a moment where we just stand on behalf of our global partner, and we are just going to pray for her. And so if you feel comfortable, you can raise your hands, but just join me in praying for our partner. Jesus, thank you so much that you are bigger than Cleveland, Tennessee. We praise you for the work that you are doing in North Africa and just the small part that we get to play in that. And I just ask that you would be with our global partner and her team and that you would help them amidst transitions. It is difficult working through government agencies and working for visas. I pray that you would give them favor and give them patience in the process. I pray that you would just fill them with your living hope, Jesus. And as they are filled up and, and hope filled by you, that that would just be contagious and the people around them would see the hope that you offer Jesus. And we just pray for opportunities as she steps onto this second location of her school, open up doors and give her the wisdom and discernment to walk through that and to take the gospel to people who have probably never heard it. We praise you ahead of time for all you're going to do in North Africa. In Jesus name we pray. Amen. You guys can have a seat. And also, if you want more information, if you stop by our prayer corner, we have these incredible cards with information. But I just love that we're in the middle of a season of prayer. And our series is simply called Prayer. And I know a lot of you guys, this is your first time with us, and we are so grateful that you'd be with us. I believe the volleyball team is here today. Can we give a shout out to the volleyball team? Thank you guys for being here with us. We appreciate it, ladies. And so I am going to tell, retell a story that I used to kick off the series on August 4th. So if you are here, it'll be a review. I didn't finish the story. I'm going to finish it today. And if you're not here, just to catch us up on where we've been at. So the story I told was about running on the beach. And here's what I learned on August 4th, that our church does not have a lot of beach runners, okay? And that's okay. No judgment here. We're praying transformation will occur. Some of you will start to move on the beach. We do have a lot of beach systems who let the ocean move. You sit there, no judgment again. However you enjoy the beach, it's awesome, right? We love the beach. Well, I love to run on the beach, and that's a big way I pray. So I'm running down the beach. A guy approaches me. He's about my age, and I'm just friendly anyway. So I'm like, hi, you know, and he looks friendly. And so as he gets to me, he goes, the pier, you got to get to the pier. And at this point, I didn't even know there was a pier. I'm in North Myrtle Beach. It was my first time there. I didn't even know it existed. But suddenly, I have a new goal. I'm like, oh, I do need to get to the pier. I bet it's awesome. I need to get to the pier. 
And I told that story because my heart in this series is just to stand up here and just go, prayer. And I hope that you can see some things that you've never seen before about prayer. Just like I didn't even know the peer was there. And I hope you can see some things again that you haven't seen in a long time. But after I told that story, Jennifer Fling, who's one of our incredible teammates, she probably helped a lot of you guys find your seat today. Jennifer asked my wife, Whitney, she said, well, did he make it to the pier? And the answer is no, I did not make it <laughs> to the pier. The reason is very practical. We have three small children, six, five, and one. I had told Whitney I would be gone for a certain amount of time. If I had kept going to the pier, I would have basically doubled that time. That is not a recipe for building trust in a marriage, free marriage counseling advice today. So I did not make it. I know it's there. I want to go back. I see it. I can't unsee it, but I never made it. So the letdown is I've not been to the pier. And the title of today's talk is Letdown. Because if you've ever prayed, you've probably been let down. You've had someone say, look at this part of prayer. Look at what God does. And he didn't do it for you. Maybe it was that job. I'm just praying, man, I need a job. And the months and months and months went by and your friends got jobs and they even got jobs in their degree, which seems more and more rare these days. And here you are, still jobless. Maybe you prayed for healing but you ended up at a funeral. Or maybe you just wanted to have a baby and you went to see the fertility doctor and did what they said to do. And you watched your friends get pregnant and have baby number one, baby number two, sometimes baby three, four. And now that window has closed for you biologically and you never had a child. At some point when we pray, we're gonna be let down. And when we are let down, that's why some of us stop praying, isn't it? That's why some of you don't pray or you don't pray about that. <laughs> There's this thing that you used to pray for. You're like, I'm not gonna pray for that anymore. Or, or here's what I've often done. Along the way, we shrink our prayers to mitigate disappointment. So, so we'll still pray, but we won't go there. I still kind of pray about that thing because I know I'm supposed to, but I'm not going to fully go there. And so here we are, day eight, 21 days of prayer. And whether it's your first one or whether it's another one, you're like, I'm at least not praying about that. So what do we do? We pray and get let down. You know, when we bring questions like this to God's word, which is what we should do, it's what we do as Jesus followers. If you don't follow Jesus, that's what we do as Jesus followers. We bring questions like this to God's word. Sometimes we find answers. Sometimes God's word is a clear answer. This is not one of those situations. We don't find answers. We find tools to help us navigate the tension. Because here's what you know and I know. The pain is too great for there to just be this simple answer. But we can find today is we can find tools to help us navigate this tension. And that's what we're going to look at. And we're going to start in Matthew chapter 22, if you have your Bible or Bible app and you want to go there with me. And just to catch us up as well, we've been talking about prayer as connecting and fighting. And I just want to encourage us that as we, we think about prayer, just know that, that God wants to spend time with you. Even if you're distant in this area, he wants to be with you. That's what week one was all about. You can go and check that out. In fact, we even have these prayer guides and, and, and if you don't have a full copy of the prayer guide, they, for all 21 days, they're back in the prayer corner. You can grab one before you go. But our heart in the prayer guide is just to simply let you know that, that God wants to be with you. And we want to remove the excuse if I don't know how to pray. You can literally just read these words and you can pray. But what we discovered in part one is that all the tools will just stay in the toolbox unless we desire him. So we've been just asking, do we desire to be with Jesus? And last week, we discussed how prayer is fighting. And, and today, as we're going to talk about letdown, even in the midst of the letdown, that prayer's fighting, that we are fighting and pushing back against the enemy and fighting for people we love. In fact, one of the key scriptures for these 21 days is Nehemiah 4.14, which says, remember the Lord, or don't be afraid of the enemy. Remember the Lord who is great and glorious and fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your home. So in these 21 days, what we're doing is we are fighting for the generations. And so we want to take a moment and we literally want to do that. So if you grab that prayer guide that you've got, we're going to just pray the prayers for day eight. 
And you're like, man, we're praying a lot. Yeah, it's 21 days of prayer, okay? So we can have two prayer moments in a gathering. And here's some good news. If you just come to three Sundays during 21 days of prayer, you'll at least pray three days because every Sunday we're going to take some time and we're just going to pray this. So it's going to be on the screen online, family. I know you may not have this. And so if you just look at the screen, if you're podcasting, um, please don't wreck. Um, Look at this later as you're driving uh, or when you stop driving, just to be clear. But, but let's just take a moment and just however you need to pray, if you need to just kneel, if you need to stand, if you need to sit, if you feel comfortable praying aloud or want to pray silently, let's just pray for both our middle school, high school students, our college students, and our young adults. And we're just going to pray, first of all, that they know the gospel and follow Jesus. And as we pray, I encourage you to imagine a middle schooler, high schooler, college student, or young adult that you love getting baptized. Let's engage our imagination as we pray. So let's pray. And now the second thing we're going to pray for, which will also be on the screen and it's on the prayer guide, is we're just going to thank Jesus for everybody who invests in these generations. And we're going to pray for more people to invest in them. And this is not just on campus. we got a coach here. This is coaches. This is teachers, professors. Let's just pray for those who are investing in this generation. And just pray that more people would step up to invest in them. Jesus, I thank you that we are a church with middle schoolers, high schoolers, college students, and young adults. I look out and I even see some coaches. I pray for special favor over them, that you give them wisdom as they're navigating their teams and investing in their players. I pray for teachers, professors, and just for these students, that they would encounter you this semester. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So again, prayer is connecting and fighting, but the question today is, what happens when you're fighting and it seems like nothing is happening? And so we go to this scene in Matthew chapter 22. N.T. Wright is a world-renowned New Testament scholar, and here's how he describes this scene. He says, this scene is so intimate and terrifying, we almost feel embarrassed to be onlookers. And I share that quote because if you've read about Jesus in the garden before, then maybe you can just be kind of callous to it. Oh, yeah, I read that. If you've never read it before, man, that's great. I hope you can get into the emotion of this scene. He said it's so intimate and it's so terrifying. There's, there's such emotion going on. It's almost like, man, should I even be like allowed to, to, to watch this? And so in order for us to let the Holy Spirit move in us today, we've got to engage emotionally. We can't just bring our intellect today. Bring that too, but let's bring our emotions as well. And I know this is possible for us because this past week, most of us have been emotionally moved by a show or a movie or a book, haven't we? Like we've been sitting on the couch watching a show and all of a sudden we're like, Ugh, or grab somebody or stand up or whatever. Or for some of us, it's sports. I know I was watching the, the U.S. men's basketball gold medal game. Apologies to our friend from France. Right over here as they were playing France. Sorry, Vincent, to bring up this bad memory. But, but they were playing France. And when Steph Curry made that shot, like, like Ella, our littlest one, she was asleep. So I kind of had to be a little muted. But he made the shot. And we're with our boys and Whitney. And I'm just like, ah! Oh, I'll sleep. He just made that shot. Did you see? I'm just going crazy. I think our boys were like, what is wrong with my dad? But I like, I couldn't help it when he made that shot. There was just an emotional reaction. I was engaged emotionally in the game. So I would encourage us to let ourselves engage emotionally, but know this, we're probably not going to feel the emotions of the U.S., but the emotions of France today. Just saying, again, apologies. So let's step into this scene. In Luke, or excuse me, Matthew chapter 26, verse 36, 6, it says, Then Jesus, he went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to them, just just sit here. Sit here while I go over there and pray. Now, what we're going to do today is we're going to bounce back and forth between Matthew, which is an eyewitness account, Mark, an eyewitness account. Peter was there and told Mark what happened. And Luke, who is a secondary source, but he basically wrote a research paper and gave it to us. So we're going to look at different angles of this scene. 
and know that all the details don't line up perfectly. But that in no way undermines the validity of Scripture. It actually confirms it. Because for all of you who maybe work in law in some way, maybe you're a lawyer, maybe you're in law enforcement, here's what you know. When you're interviewing witnesses and they all say the exact same details, here's what's going on. Collusion and they're lying. Real eyewitness accounts have some discrepancy in the details because of the perspectives of the people involved. And so as we see this scene from different angles, this just confirms the validity of what actually happened in the garden. So here's what Luke tells us in Luke chapter 22, verse 39. He says, Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives, another name for the Garden of Gethsemane, and his disciples followed him. So notice that he says he went out as usual. Just a quick note for all of us who are parents or all of us who are spiritual parents. Because even if you're not a biological parent, we should be discipling someone if we follow Jesus and be a spiritual parent to them. And the question for us is, do they know our usual places of prayer? Do they know our prayer rhythms? Look, there's nothing normal about what's going to happen here in the garden. It's extremely intense. But the intensity of this moment happened within the consistency of prayer rhythms in Jesus' life. So as we're investing in people, they should know our prayer rhythms. They should know how we usually pray. That's part of the discipleship process. The disciples knew that of Jesus. Let's not be people who just pray when it's intense, but let's be consistent in our prayers. And it says that he took with him Peter, going back to Matthew, the two sons of Zebedee along with him. And he began to be sorrowful and troubled. This is where we begin to feel the emotion. He is distressed. He's filled with angst and anguish. And it says, he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. So stay here and watch with me. Eugene Peterson, in the message paraphrase of Mark's account, says it this way, he plunged into a sinkhole of dreadful agony. This is the emotions of Jesus. This is not a scene where he's got it all together and he's polished. This is a let your hair down and just cry out to God because his soul is deeply troubled. This is where Jesus is at. And he asks him, he says, hey, could, could, could you just stay here? Just, he didn't even ask him to pray right now. He says, just, just keep watch with me. And here's what I realize is that in these moments where our soul is just in turmoil, we really want people just to be with us, don't we? We want somebody just to sit with us in our pain. And in a few weeks, we're going to launch community groups. That's a big reason we have community groups, is to, to help you find some people that when you're feeling like this, that, that you know they're going to sit with you in their pain. And I'll just tell you, you may not find them in the first semester. It may take you a while, but, but just keep at it. Because God wants to surround you with some people that will just be with you in your pain. That's what Jesus is asking for. And then if you look at verse, the rest of the verse, he says, my father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet, yet not as I will, but as you will. If we look at Mark's account, and here's what Mark wrote about what Jesus said. It says, Jesus started out this way in verse 36. He said, Abba, Father, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. We're going to look at the content of Jesus' prayer a little later. But first, let's just focus on the emotion. Mark lets us know that he starts out with this very intimate cry of Abba. This is the equivalent of a, a kid being like, Daddy, Dad. I mean, it's just this heart cry. And here's what he says. Everything is possible for you. Jesus is just in anguish. He says, Dad, everything is possible for you. He's crying out to him. And what I skipped in the Matthew narrative is it says that what he did is he, he fell down and prayed. Now, now, the typical Jewish prayer posture is honestly what we did for our global partner. It's you stand up, eyes and um, hands to heaven. That is how Jews typically prayed. So what Jesus does here is he, he's kind of getting this place of prayer, and he's just like, Ugh. and he's just so distraught, he just falls. And, I, and I'm wondering, have you, have you been there? I have. I've just been so frustrated and filled with angst that when I come before God, I just fall down and Jesus he just falls down he's like dad come on I know everything's possible from for you would you just please change the situation 
And then it says, if we go back to Matthew's account in verse 40, he returned to his disciples and he found them sleeping. <laughs> Couldn't you men keep watch with me for one hour, he asked Peter? Watch and pray so you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. I mean, like, they all fell asleep. Why is he calling out Peter? Because just about like an hour, hour and a half before, Peter goes, Jesus, all these other jokers will abandon you, but I never will. And so Jesus is like, oh, Peter, big dog here, you know, really keeping it together, like can't even stay awake. Good job, Peter. What's the deal? And so I'll fall asleep. But he says, no, you got to fight. You know, prayer is fighting. He tells them to fight. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And then if we look at Luke's account, we see something else that is happening that helps us feel the emotion of this moment. In verse, Luke chapter 22, verse 43, it says, and an angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. Jesus is so just drained and exhausted emotionally that the father hears him and sends an angel to strengthen him. One observation we made last week is that our prayers activate supernatural forces, and this reinforces that that the father sends an angel to strengthen him. And then the next thing, Luke is a doctor, so he gives a medical detail. He says, being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. This has been confirmed by medical professionals, that he was in such turmoil that his sweat is literally becoming blood and falling to the ground. All, verse 45, when he rose from prayer and went back to the disciples, he found them asleep, and they are exhausted, from sorrow. This is how we know, know that it was just all men there because the men were so frustrated and so tired, they were just like, ah. Can all the wives say amen? I was trying to talk to you about that and you just fell asleep. Like, what is the deal here, you know? And so they're just out. Their eyes were heavy and they are asleep. So here's the emotion, but Thankfully, if we go to Hebrews chapter 5, which we're going to next, the author of Hebrews, Hebrews, he gives us even more insight into the content of Jesus' prayer, more insight into what's going on in this scene. So if you would, join me in Hebrews chapter 5. It'll also be on the screen if you don't want to go over there. But in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 7, it says, during the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears. So that's what we've seen here, right? Jesus is just crying out in anguish to God. Loud cries are what some of your translations read. Loud cries and tears. And it says, here's who he was praying to. He was praying to the one who could save him from death. Some translations say to the one who is able. We need to know tonight, today, that when we pray, we are praying to a God who is able. We are praying to a God with power. We are praying for a God to a God of breakthrough who can do things that we can't even begin to imagine. That's who Jesus is praying to. That's who we're praying to. Now, before we go on, pause, because some of you are like, I thought Jesus was God. He's praying to God. What's going on? We're talking about the Trinity here. We have one God that expresses himself in three unique ways, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. If that's a little bit confusing to you, it's been confusing to theologians for centuries, okay? But one God, three unique persons, and he's praying to a God who is able. And then it says this, who could save him from death. And here, better news, and he was heard. So the God who is able, his father, for whom Jesus said, Father, everything is possible for you, his father heard him. Now, if you've heard this story, pretend like you've never heard it before. At this point, what do you think will happen? What has it been leading us up to? Here's what you think will happen, that Jesus will be saved from the father who is able from death. That's what we think will happen. He was heard. He'll be saved from death. But it doesn't say that. It says he was heard because of his reverent submission. Son though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered. Whoa, 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 why suffering? I thought he was about to be delivered. And once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. What's going on? First of all, if you're wrestling with Jesus learned things and he was made perfect and became the source of eternal salvation, what is this talking about? Jesus was fully God and he was fully human. So as God, he's perfect. But as a human, he had to go through the natural process of development. There's things that 13-year-olds can do that three-year-olds can't. There's just the growth and development. And this idea that he became obedient to the point of death, 
No, the scripture tells us that from the foundation of the world, Jesus was the lamb slain. The cross was not plan B, C, it was plan A from the beginning. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit said he is the lamb slain from the foundation of the world, but then he had to come to earth and actually die and actually step into that identity of who he had always been declared to be. And so that's what's happening here as he becomes the source of eternal salvation because, oh, he died. Wait. He, he, he died? He prayed to the God who was able to save him from death, and he was heard, and he died? He wasn't saved from death? In other words, the father heard Jesus, and he told him no. This is the letdown that Jesus experienced. So Tyler Staten phrases it this way. An incredible book he wrote, he says, when we find ourselves let down in prayer, look around, because Jesus is there. He is in the garden with us as the one who has been told no by his father. Just before this, the author of Hebrews says that Jesus is the one who can empathize with us because he's walked earth as a human. He's been through all the trials, including praying to his father and hearing no. And if the father told Jesus no, don't you think he's going to tell us no sometimes as well? And so it, interesting things we're wrestling with. Okay, Jesus was let down, but, but he was heard. And maybe you've struggled with that. Like, how do I make sure that God hears me? I may not like the answer he gives. We'll get to that in just a moment. But how do I make sure he hears me? Well, well author of Hebrews says he was heard because of his reverent submission. Well, what does that mean? If we go back to Matthew and we look at the content of his prayers, again, in verse 39, he prayed, my father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Then go down to verse 42. A second time he prayed, my father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. In other words, Jesus is like, hey, if you could take this cup away, please do it. But if the bigger plan requires me to drink the cup of God's wrath, then I will drink the cup. So Jesus was heard because he prayed prayers that were characterized by honesty and surrender. See, Jesus has experienced the letdown, and Jesus is the blueprint for how we pray. We pray honest prayers. Cry out to God. Jesus wasn't holding anything back. What are you walking through? Would you just cry out to God and be honest with Him? But it's easy to be honest and pushy, isn't it? Honest and pushy looks like this. God, if you don't, then I'm going to pushy with God. Or here's a more subtle way that we're honest and pushy. God, if you do this, <laughs> then I'll do this. And we're trying to manipulate our Father in heaven. That's being honest and pushy. That, that's not the way Jesus prayed. He was completely honest and his prayer was marked by immense surrender. The way Eugene Peterson phrases what Jesus said is he says that Jesus said it like this, you, what do you want, Father? So that we're honest and we're in surrender. And here's what I found in my life. I don't know about you, but oftentimes I can masquerade defeat as surrender. Because I've been let down, I've shrunk the size of my prayers and I pray prayers like, oh God, I know you can do all things, but you're not going to. I know I'm supposed to pray about this thing, so just... Go ahead, they're gonna die anyway. Go ahead, it's not gonna work out. Yeah. I'm surrendered. No, we're not surrendered, we're defeated. So what Jesus challenges us to do by his example is that we would pray prayers that are both honest. God, this is what I really need to happen. This is what I wanna happen. God, would you do this? And, but what do you want, Father? So the questions that I wanna invite us to wrestle with is, do we need more honesty or do we need more surrender? Maybe it's a little bit of both. Do we need more honesty 
or do we need more surrender? Let's wrestle with that this week. And then an observation that can perhaps help us, a question I've been asking is, um, could it be that God in his sovereignty and love redeems our no's? Mm. Could it be that God in his sovereignty and no, he can redeem the no's and redeem the letdown because this is the story of Jesus. His father did not save him from death because his father saved us through his death. Like Jesus' no became our yes. Do we understand today that if the father had told Jesus yes, we would have no hope of salvation. But through his death, he is able to offer us life. And and N.T. Wright makes the observation that that oftentimes when we think about being saved or rescued from something, we want to be rescued from. I just said it. Rescued from. But in the Bible, oftentimes we're rescued through. Like, Like Daniel, to go back to a classic story, if you've never read it, you should look it up and read it. Daniel was not saved from the lion's den. Daniel was saved through the lion's den. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, again, go back and read this story. They were not saved from the fire. They were saved through the fire. And guess what? While they were in the fire, a fourth man showed up, and his name is Jesus, because he's the one who's been in the garden, pouring out his soul for his father to tell him no. So when we are let down, he is there with us and Jesus he was not saved from death but come on we are saved through his death that's why he's the only one who can join us in the garden and lead us out the other side because he knows the path to resurrection the father the father is so loving and so sovereign that he can even redeem our knows you know Paul one of the leaders of the early church he, he wrote a couple verses 2 Corinthians 12 9 and 10 that for centuries Jesus followers have clung to in moments of weakness he, here, here's what Paul wrote Paul wrote this he said mm. he said Jesus tells me my grace is sufficient for you for my power is made perfect in weakness therefore I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me that is why for Christ's sake I delight in weaknesses and in insults and in hardships and persecutions and in, in difficulties or adversity for when I am weak then I'm strong I'm telling you for centuries Jesus followers when we feel weak we're facing adversity we've come to these verses and we found strength but back up to verse 7 why did Paul write this because in verse 7 it says in order to keep me from becoming conceited I was given a thorn in my flesh a messenger of Satan to torment me so he had something in his life that was making him miserable and look what happened it said three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me so three times Paul came before the father and said would you take it away would you take it away would you take it away and the father told him no and because the father told him no we get verses 9 and 10 that we have anchored in for centuries could it be that God redeems our nose. Katie Maxwell is our executive assistant and her and Alex have been walking through a huge letdown in their life. It's so frustrating. Katie said something to me this week as we we're discussing this talk. She said, a question I keep asking is what is God sparing our family from? Mm. Look, they are so frustrated and angry and honest. And that is a question. Of surrender you know as public worship comes up and they're going to lead us in a song in just a moment I think back to a time and Whitney's in my life where we really had to face this when I first met Whitney um, her dad was in a rehab facility because he had um, attempted several times to take his life and they were praying for his healing praying that he would come home different and um, he never came home he ended up taking his life. I know when I talked to Whitney about this, I told her like the, the healing, it, it never came. So we got to know. And she said, no, 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 the healing came. It just didn't come on this side of eternity like we wanted it to. 
And what I've watched as I've walked through this with my wife, I've watched her sit across the table from other young ladies who are dealing with their parents' suicide or their parents' lives falling apart. And I've, I've seen her begin to sit with them in that pain and offer empathy and comfort. And I've watched the redemption begin to come. But, but let me just be clear, none of us would have chosen this. Like what I want today is for our three kids to go home and for Poppy to come to our house and then to jump up in his arms and us just to play together. Because he would have been an awesome grandfather. But that's not our story. We wouldn't choose it, but God is redeeming it. And that's what he does. He redeems it. He loves us. So my challenge for us today, would you pray that prayer? That one that you stop praying. Would you go there with your heavenly father? Where would you take that prayer that you've shrunk to mitigate disappointment and would we make it audacious and would we be vulnerable enough that God could let us down? I was reading a book by Philip Yancey called The Jesus I Never Knew and he spoke with a hospice doctor. I don't know if any of you guys do that, but I mean, your whole career is surrounded by death. You're helping people face death. And he said one of the things that brings him great comfort and that he comforts his patients with is that when we're praying, we're praying to a God who died. Like, like what other God died? Jesus died. He didn't escape death. He went through death. And so we pray to him. We know that, yes, he died, but he is no longer dead. He has risen from the dead and he can offer us resurrection and hope and life even in the darkest valley. So when the rug gets pulled out from under us, and it's going to, let's go to the garden. There we'll find Jesus and there he will be with us. So maybe you're here and you don't follow Jesus and you've seen a side of Jesus that you had never seen before. If you wanna follow him, please just go back to the prayer corner. We'd love to talk with you about what it means to repent, to turn away from your sins, to turn towards the ways of God and to follow Jesus. And maybe you just need prayer. Man, our, our prayer teammates, they would love to be here. I know it's crowded and we celebrate that, but I know it can be hard in a moment like this. You may be over in this corner or in the lobby or kind of hidden over here, but just, just crawl over people. They'll let you go if you need to go back and be prayed over. And maybe you just want to write down a prayer request. We have prayer cards. You could grab one on your way out. You can put your name and number so we can follow up with you later or you just have it anonymous. We will pray for every prayer card at our prayer gathering on Wednesday night, I promise you. But as these guys lead us in a song, the... The bridge of this song says, so I sought the Lord and he heard and he answered me. And admittedly, those can be tough words to sing after a talk like this. Because some of us feel like I sought the Lord and he didn't hear and he didn't answer me. And so I just want to remind us of Jesus, that Jesus sought his father and his father heard and his father told him no. And that's why the next line of the song is what Jesus did. And Jesus said, then that's why I trust in my father. So know this, man, when we seek him, he hears us and he answers. It just may be no, but would we trust him even in the no because his ways are better Romans 8 28 says and we know that God causes all things everything all things the no's all things to work together for good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose so I just want to tell you today that if it's not good then he's not done now let me just remind you that once we die and pass on, it still may not be good. But that's because when we are in heaven, he's still working. So will we trust him? Will we trust him in the no? So let's sing. Let's pray. Let's have this time with Jesus.